Moses getting married and having a son killed an Egyptian and he fled to Midian uh, which uh, is over here on our map you can see uh, Midian uh, which was quite a travel in fact Bob how, how long would it have taken him to go from where he was to Midian do you have any concept or thought of what that'd be well he was over in this area it took the children of Israel three months to get over there so <laughs> three months uh, is it probably it, him by, you know, himself, by himself maybe two two and a half yeah. months Quite a yeah. <laughs> uh, and so he did he did flee um it's uh the we're going to continue with the with the study of moses you got anything else on the recap brother no that's fine uh so let's uh dive into exodus uh chapter three we're going to read verses one through four uh to start with and tonight we now have mic'd up the one and only Ruth Ann Cobb. And so she now has a mic, so that will help. But uh, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. I normally let Bob try talk first, uh, but I'd really like to talk first on this one if I can. You bet. Uh, I have always wanted to preach this text because um, I've read it so many times, but then whenever you really pay attention to what happens, it's an amazing story. As Moses is out there and he sees this, uh, he sees this burning bush, and, and look what it says, uh, and he looked and be, behold, held the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now I just picture, and maybe this is one of the reasons I've always wanted to preach this, but I've always just pictured him kind of walking, looking over to see a burning bush, and, and he keeps walking, and this bush just keeps burning, and, and it brings his attention. But notice what this scripture says, uh, what happens as he sees this. So he sees it, and he sees it's not consumed. And I think this, this takes place for a little bit of time. As he's kind of paying attention. And then all of a sudden it says, Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see what a great sight. So at some point, as he's looked at this multiple times, he finally decides, You know what? I'm going to leave from where I'm going, and I'm going to go this direction. I was going this direction. Now I'm going to turn, and I'm going to go that direction. And when he turned and went that direction, what happened next? Look what it says there. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, the Lord was not going to talk to Moses until Moses turned and came to the Lord. Moses could have kept walking and missed the whole conversation. The Lord waited until he sees him turn and put his attention on where the Lord is. And then the Lord when, he's, when the Lord saw that he turned, Moses had to turn first before the Lord talked to him. And I thought about that. I've thought about that so many times. I've wanted, like I said, I've wanted to preach this so many times because I think that's what salvation looks like. When we turn away from our sin and self and look at the Lord, and that's when the Lord calls us or talks to us in salvation. But I also think that is the, the way in our walk, in our Christian walk. I think so many of us spend so much time just walking and we're going and we're going. And you're like, I never hear from the Lord. I, you know, I don't know. My prayer life is rough. I don't, don't seem like I, wanna, I don't want to read the Bible. And, and uh, you know, things are just rough. It might be that you're walking and not stopping and turning and going to the Lord. If you'll stop and turn to the Lord, he might see that you have turned. And once he sees that you've turned, then he might talk to you. <coughs> I'm sorry. Does that make sense? I just love the order of what that goes through. In fact, I have, I've got that underlined in my scripture. I will now turn, once he turns, 
After he turns, the Lord says, but the Lord calls to him. But the Lord saw that he turned first. I don't know, Brother Bob. I've, you were talking about getting excited uh, back there a minute ago about Scripture and stuff. This right. is one that I just get so excited about. Well, that's a good one. And this is quite a turning point. We're seeing something God had prepared for this time for many years since Abraham when he selected that he was going to build a nation. And that's it's 430 years since Abraham went into Canaan at the age of 75 years old. So it's been 430 years from that to come to this point. How old, how old was Moses at this time? Now, he was just born in chapter 2. Yeah, so he's just <laughs> born in chapter 2, so he has to be, what, 10 years old? How old is Moses right now when this chapter 3 takes place? 80? He is 80 years old. Acts 7, verse 30 says, and 40 years had passed when... Uh, the Lord appeared to him in a burning bush. So he was 40 when he fled, when he, when there in Egypt that we saw last week when he fled, and now he's out in the wilderness, uh, out, well, out there tending sheep for 40 years. Uh, what a job change, huh? See, Moses was a prince, actually a prince here for 40 years, and then 40 years here, he's a shepherd. Now that's quite a change. And, and Jonathan said that last week after uh, we, our service said that God was preparing him in the living condition, in the environment that he was going to spend the next 40 years in. So, and not only that, but, uh, you know, we know that Moses at the age of 40, when he killed the Egyptian, he was planning on delivering the children. He knew, he felt that God was leading him to do that, but he was doing out of his own power and his own zeal, and he was excited about it, but God wasn't so excited about it. So he spent 40 years out there, Becoming meek, becoming content, and humble. And then God was able to use him uh, from that, that point on. So we see there uh, that he's tending the sheep. And Jethro, who also is known by what? What was the, what did chapter 2 tell us? Rule? Oh, well, yeah, what his other name was? His other name, His yeah. other name, Rule? Yeah, and uh, he's a priest of Midian. Uh, and he comes to the mountain of God. Sometimes Horeb is also, uh, most scholars believe that's Mount Sinai. Uh, and there's others that believe there's two peaks there, and the west side is Horeb, and the east side is Sinai. But uh, uh, at least in some places, they, they're both called the mountain of God. So... And then we see here the angel of the Lord. Uh, but what, who do we find that it is? Yeah, so when it says angel of the Lord, who is the angel of the Lord that it says right there? Who is that? Jesus? Everybody else want to agree with that? It is, yes. Most, most scholars believe that. Doug's not going to look it, at me. He's just, <laughs> he's like, all right. Most but scholars believe that it is the pre-incarnate. Uh, Jesus Christ, because everything was made through him and for him. And we find that in John uh, verse 3, and uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. And we also find that in uh, Colossians 1, I believe it's 14 and 16. So we believe that is Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnation of Jesus there, speaking from the bush. Now, we see that the bush looks like it's burning and it is not consumed. What does this symbolize to you? What are some things you might think of uh, that that might represent or be a symbol or emblem of? Something burning but not consumed. And fire usually meant holiness and justice. What might that make you think of? Holy Spirit? Yeah, we know when the day of Pentecost, when they received the Holy Spirit, the fire of tongues came down. You saw uh, the fire, yeah. Landed on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, this could represent the nation of Israel in bondage. They're under fire, aren't they? But they're not being consumed, are they? In fact, they're thriving. They're prospering. The church under persecution. What happens when the church is under persecution? It, tends, it thrives, thrives. And it grows, doesn't it? Uh, Christ 
his death, his burial. But he overcame that, didn't he, when it rose. So we see God's presence in these events, and they are not consumed. They overcame. And that's what we see here. This bush uh, is not consumed. Uh, and the Lord speaks out of it and, and calls to Moses. And he says right there, um, Moses, when he turns, he says, I want to go see this great sight uh, that was there. In fact, it must have been very amazing to have seen this because he said it, he called it a great sight. Um, back on the, the angel of the Lord, my, in my translation, it has angel of the Lord capitalized. Is everyone else's capitalized? I think no. that's one, one way we can typically yeah. tell. But a lot of, probably some in here is not capitalized. Anybody got it not capitalized? Here's not. Um, uh, it, so, but, but I think most translations do, do translate it as capital. Mm -hmm. But the next verse that we're going to read, I think also indicates uh, that this is the Lord and what he causes him to do uh, here. It wouldn't have just been an angel because of what is about to happen next. Um, Jonathan, the other day in uh, your video, you said there was how many people that uh, uh, God called by name twice? Yeah. I knew that you had, you had mentioned that, and he calls Moses, Moses here by name twice. Yeah, and when you do that to your kids? They know it. Pay attention. Pay attention. <laughs> and if you ever get to their middle name, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else there, brother? No, that's fine. I love uh, Moses' answer. He says, Moses says, I mean, God says, or Christ says, Moses, Moses, and he says, here I am. Here I am. I think that should be the answer that we always have when we hear the call of God on our life. Here I am. When, when you turn aside from sin and self and surrender to Christ, to, to Christ for salvation, here I am. You take my life. You do with it what you want. But as you walk through your Christian walk, I think you continually do that. Here I, here I am. Do with me what you want. It's what Mary said. All right, let's, uh, let's read verses 5 and 6. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father." God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So we see here he tells him to take his sandals off. And I love the song, I'm Standing on Holy Ground. That's what we should have sang tonight. I thought about that. I see, yeah, I should have. <laughs> and what, what is all around? Angels. Angels is all around. Anyway, uh, yeah, this shows that it is holy ground. And he tells him, I am. He didn't say I was the father of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. He says I am, doesn't he? Meaning he is to that day. And Moses said he hid his face. Why did he do that? Why would he cover his face? Yeah, he, yeah, it says he was afraid to look up on God. Now think about this for just a moment. He's, he's already watched this b bush burn for a while. We don't know how long, but he's seen this bush burn. But when he realizes what it is, that's whenever he covers his Cover face. Covers his face, yes. It wasn't the looking at the fire that caused the, the covering of the face. It was the fact that he realized it was God. Now, now picture that for just a moment, because there will be a day when we will stand before God. And I love that song, I Can Only Imagine. You know, are you going to fall on your face? I think that that's typically will be the response, falling on your face. Um, because Moses certainly wanted to cover his. Yeah, because we find many times in the Scripture where God had given a command and the people did not follow that. And like the strange fires that the sons of Aaron made up, oh, yeah. they died for it. And how many looked into the Ark of the 
covenant, the ark of the Lord. How many of them died? 50,070 of them died, didn't they? Uh, for not being obedient and doing something against the command of the Lord. Um, Why did he tell him to take his sandals off? Bob, were you going to answer that or are you asking a question? can't do it yeah huh. that's a that's a good com uh, connection there that's why I always have my shoes untied Bob was making fun of me for always wearing my shoes untied I keep them untied just in case it, we have to take them off real quick yeah I told somebody last week that you could tell how, how what the age difference is there's 25 <laughs> years there mine's tied in double knots and his is not tied at all <laughs> that's 25 years <laughs> I hate tight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he'll get there sooner than he wants. <laughs> um, all right. Anything else there, brother? That's it. All right. Let's uh, look at 7 through 10. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the opposition with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God. Oh, that's good. Just through 10. Okay. Okay, we see that in chapter 2, uh, verse 24, that it says God remembered uh, the children of Israel. He remembered them, and this is what he's getting ready to do, is to deliver them. And they're going to be that nation that's going to be a, a witness for him uh, is his plan. And it says, uh, he heard their cry, for I know their sorrow. So he's getting ready. He's promised them a land flowing with milk and honey, isn't he? And then it tells about the different nations that occupy Canaan. And these are the seven nations that they're not supposed to marry or and they're supposed to drive out. And uh, not supposed to marry into that we've talked about. That's on the, the other board. It's on the other board. Have. I got that's it in, in there. In there. Yeah. So he mentioned those by name. And uh, he tells Moses what he plans to do. Now, what is he going to do? He's going to tell Moses to, uh, as we get into the next verse here, uh, what he wants from him here. I'm sure Moses is wondering, what's going on? Why is he telling me all of this <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> at this point? Um, by, by the way, has God ever changed? No. Johnny was bold to say no. Has God ever changed? No, there's some, there's, it's interesting. You think, as you read some scripture, you think, well, did God change his mind there whenever... You know, he said he was going to do something, and then he didn't. And, but did he change his mind, or was it a test? And so there's some things you can talk. But no, Johnny, you're right. God has never changed, right? Yeah. He's, God has been the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, uh, and every day in between. Um, so God is absolutely the same. Right. We do find places in where, uh, like Moses interceded for the people. For the people, yeah. And yep. he, he uh, answered Moses and and didn't destroy him. And like said, he yeah, he's going to destroy all of them. But, he's like, I'm going to destroy him. And, and Moses inter yeah. interceded. And all right, and Malachi, I'm not to... Malachi 3, 6 says, I'm the Lord. I do not change. I do not change. <laughs> and I say that to say, do me a favor. In verse number 7, when you read that, and he says, And the Lord said, 
I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Some of the things that we go through in life, there are times when we're in areas of sorrow and pain, and we don't think that the Lord hears us. In fact, I would encourage you to underline that because the same God that know, knew what was going on with the children of Israel knows exactly what you are going through, even maybe right now. He doesn't change. So he knows his children and the pain and sorrow and the heartache that they have. In fact, I was actually thinking, wouldn't it be neat if people actually took that word there and just wrote kind of your name out there? For he knows my, he knows Joshua Ramsey's sorrows. The, and, and take that verse and use it as one that, that brings you assurance that God knows you in your sorrow. Because he doesn't change. He knew the children of Israel, their sorrow, so he knows your sorrow because you're his child as much as they were his. Amen. Anything else there, brother? Fine. Uh, verse number th- so through there you see what happens uh, uh, in verse number 10 he says come therefore and I will send you to Pharaoh that you might bring my people the children of Israel out of Egypt I wonder what went through Moses' mind when he heard that <laughs> y'all should have seen Doug's face <laughs> well yeah we're going to get his first excuse he's had five excuses and we're going to see the first one here. the first excuse is coming up the first of five uh, excuses he's going to give uh, I, I would imagine he's been out there in this wilderness now for 40 years. He might have had a dream at one point to deliver the children of Israel. He had already thought that. We've already seen where Scripture said that. I would think he has thought that dream is past and gone. And now all of a sudden, God says, now we're ready. Now's the time. Now's the time. Let's... <laughs> All right, let's read verse number 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Wow. Excuse number one. Yep, that's number one. Who am I? Well, Moses... You're like all the rest of us. Without God, you're not. You're just not. He's just not anything. But God is going to work through him, and God talked to him. But he is. He's saying here, you know, hey, not me, Lord. Not me. How about somebody else? Who am I to go to Pharaoh? Well, what connection does Moses have with Egypt? Forty years, doesn't he? Why me? Yeah, that's a good place to have us in this when the Lord is going to use us. That's where he wants us. Who am I? It shows some humility, I think, in saying, am I worthy to do this? I'm not capable of doing this. That's what he's telling him. I don't have the ability to do this. I don't have the talent. I don't have the know-how. God said, good, good. <laughs> that's exactly the way I want you is where you don't think that you can do it. Because, in fact, I was thinking about this uh, text and how many many preachers um, that have been out there that started out like this, and then all of a sudden they have some some success and and they write a book and they become somebody um, and they're known and now they're being requested to come talk and all of a sudden they leave this thought of, I'm not, there's no way that I'm worthy to do this, to, oh yeah, I'm the Mount One. And they start trusting in their own abilities. The next thing you know, they're wanting a pat on the back. In fact, Jonathan uh, and I just shared a little bit ago uh, about um, how the world, uh, how how pastors and preachers uh, want a pat on the back from the world. And that's somebody who has lost what it feels like to, to be that person that says, I'm not worthy to do this. I can't do it. They, they, they've started trusting in their own abilities. Um, 
I love that statement, though. I think that all of us, God calls us to, to major tasks. Um, and some of them look different. Some of them might be pastoring a church. Some of them might be just, let, I'm called to the task to show somebody mercy or grace. And you're like, that is the biggest thing to do. How can I do that? But that's what God has called you to. Um, all right, let's keep going. Verses, uh, verse 12, let's just see the answer. So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. He answers him. Yeah, I'll show you. It's okay. We got this. Yeah. Right? Um, and the mountain is the one that we just talked about. Or, yeah, and I tend to believe that it's Mount Sinai. I yeah. don't know what your thoughts are, Brother Yeah, Bob, I think but, it's probably the same. <laughs> uh, I think, that, I think that it is Mount Sinai that they're referring to there. It's, it's called by two different names. Um, but I, I think that, there's, like Bob said, people think there's two different peaks. I think that it's, it's really Mount Sinai, um, just because the importance of it and how he says, he, he specifically calls to mind here that uh, when you brought your people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on, on this mountain. Right. And, and one other point when we talk about that mountain now that mountain is over here in Midian. Most people believe that Mount Sinai is on the peninsula of Sinai. But I've heard and I've, I've seen some proof that's probably not true. It's actually, which is Saudi Arabia today, is over uh, in Midian. And that's where Moses is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so it makes sense that it would be. Yeah. And in this, that she's, let's see, no, she didn't read the 13. 13 and 14. Let's read 13 and 14 together. Wow, it's 730 already. Whew. Bob, I thought we were going to have to do two chapters tonight. <laughs> I'm going to have to go. We're going to get the sec second excuse here. Go second ahead. excuse. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers have sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So Moses is, is playing here, and he says, What is the name? What shall I say to them? In other words, is he kind of... Pleading ignorance? <laughs> he is. He's like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Who am I? He starts with, who am I? And then he basically says, who are you? And what does God say? I love that verse number 15. I'm 14. I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. That's all you got to do. Say, I am sent you. What is God saying there when he calls himself I am? What is God saying right there when he says, tell them I am? What does that mean? Say that, Janet. That he is supreme? The creator? He is whatever is needed. I am. I think it is, in fact, I'm, I'm interested in what Bob says, but I think it is, I have always been, I always will be. It is. He's self-existent. It means that he is the same today, tomorrow and forever. It means that he is incomprehensible, unchangeable. There is no one else. Yeah. Me. The only one. Yeah. It's, an, it's an amazing phrase to think about when he says, I am. I am. Okay. We've only got through two of those. Shall we hold the rest of them until yeah, next I mean. week? I was like, we're not, it's going to be 8 o'clock before we get out of here. 
I'm sorry I talked so much at the beginning, but y'all got me. Please, thank you, Brother Jan. I do appreciate that. So there's two of the excuses. We've got three more to look at next week about what Moses, his, his excuses on why he can't deliver the uh, children of Israel. In fact, it's really interesting, God's response as it goes um, uh, through here. So... Um, uh, I look forward to us uh, studying through this. Hey, don't forget uh, First Samuel. We'll be reading our books with us, First Samuel, uh, as we're going through that. Do you have anything else? Oh, All right. Does anybody have anything, Brother Johnny? Amen. In fact, let's, let's pray right now, brother. Father, Lord God, we come before your holy throne. And Father, we love you. We are so thankful that you call us your children, that you have adopted us into your family, that we can call you Abba, Father. To have a God so loving. You know our sorrows. You know our pains. You know our hardships. Father, and I, uh, right now, I pray that you would be with Sister Sandra. Father, that you, would, that you would allow her to have a good, peaceful, restful night. I pray, for, I pray for the news that they hear tomorrow and the surgery that needs to happen. And Father, I pray that you would, make, that you would allow this to go smoothly. That, Father, that, uh, they, that she would be restored to health. Father, we do pray about that pain as, as she's been living in for, for some time. That, you, that it would be eased. Father, I pray that, uh, that um, through it all, that we glorify your name. Father, I ask that your hand would be upon this church, that you would lead and that you would guide and direct us. Let us be yielded to your Holy Spirit, Father, that you would lead us unto all truth. Oh, Father, lead us into all truth. Let us take off our own, our own thoughts, our own minds, and allow your word, your spirit, to be what light that, that leads us through life. Father, I ask uh, this all in the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Mm-hmm.